Sloan to the, um, speak today. So we're going to cover the history and restoration of uh, New Island. So I'm just going to do a quick overview on who Titanic Foundation are. So we are the charity that set up to see the development of Titanic Belfast. Our remit is for our preserving Belfast maritime and industrial heritage. And then we work with the private developers on destination market and management and development. And then we're, our charitable objective is about um, promoting Titanic borders to share space, sorry, for the people of Belfast and Northern Ireland. So we're going to be um, referring back to the timeline, um, which is 130 years. Um, so we'll be flashing in and out um, during a session. So um, I'm going to pass over to Sally to cover the history. Um, thank you very much, Lee. Um, I know that there are some folk here who possibly are far more has far more practical knowledge of lighthouses and optics. So um, I want to learn from you. If I get anything wrong, um, please let me know because uh, there is no book that you can open and read um, easily and just uh, uh, copy. So there's been a fair amount of uh, research. Um, both newspaper research, uh, the US Lighthouse uh, Society have been wonderfully helpful, as has the World Lighthouse Society. And it's actually um, gathering the information uh, to, to create a coherent story. And the story is about the optic. Um, and the optic obviously sits in the lighthouse. So the lighthouse, the optic, the folk who ran the lighthouses um, all become intermeshed. But I want to take you back to a Frenchman, and it took me a while to know that you pronounced it Fresnel, not Fresnel. Um, uh, Augustin Jean Fresnel was a fantastic French. He was an engineer, really. He was put to work on the roads. Uh, he was violently opposed to Napoleon and got into all sorts of trouble. <coughs> uh, but in, eventually, the French discovered that he was actually very, very talented and asked him to sort out lighthouses. And as some of you know, lighthouses started as bonfires or braziers, and then slowly they wanted to raise the light so that the mariners could see the light. So you got it higher and higher, and eventually you create a lighthouse. But for centuries, those lighthouses, uh, the light in the lighthouses were run by a cap was, was a candle. And it was usually a candle made from um, spermatocea oil, whale oil, which comes from the brain of the whales. So it wasn't particularly sustainable in, in our modern terminology. So Fresnel um, knew that he needed to create a lens. So the understanding, the, the understanding about the physics of light was only just coming into fruition. And there was a lot of discussion. You're talking about the late uh, Enlightenment uh, period and the understanding of physics. So he knew he needed a magnifying lens. But if you had a massive lens, you also have a massive weight. And it's very, very bulky. So he came up with the idea of essentially cutting off the face of the lens so you had a flat lens with refracting and uh, magnifying surfaces. The one on, his, on the left is more or less his first attempt. And the other thing you have to understand at this time is knowledge about making glass. You needed glass that was wonderfully clear, no bubbles. The moment you put a bubble in the glass, you cause the light to refract and bend again. So it had to be absolutely pure glass. And the glass makers could not make his glass the way he wanted to. And in the end, he started to work with uh, uh, another Frenchman um, to literally, he was a, he was a, uh, a jewellery watchmaker, so he had that precision. And they absolutely, they, they spent hours grinding the gla glass into this um, sort of trapezoid um, formation. And then the, the one on the right is how they started to perfect it. So this was um, a major advance. <coughs> and from this, you start to get the Fresnel optics that we now consider in lighthouses. So they were made in what we call now six orders, the six being the smallest, the first being the biggest. 
So these started to be uh, put into lighthouses around the world. <coughs> the French manufacturers, Barbier uh, were, and a couple of others, were the leading lighthouse manufacturers because they were in France, they had Segobin, um, the royal glass makers, who were make, was now making this glass. They had Augustin Fresnel and Le Pont. So the French had a big lead. Sneaking up behind were the Chance Brothers from Birmingham. And the Chance Brothers were in the mid-1850s making the Crystal <coughs> Palace. So they were fantastic glassmakers in the middle of England. In, you would now know them as Pilkington Glass. They were taken over and merged, um, and what is left of the Chance Brothers is now um, part of Pilkington Glass. So you had six orders. Now, the um, largest had a focal length of 920 millimeters. <coughs> That's from where the lamp is. And I worked with an electrician who always said that bulbs grow in <coughs> the ground and lamps create the light. So, was, so the lamp, from the lamp to the front surface of the uh, lens was 920 millimeters. So it's just under a meter. So it's a big lens. You start to get the feel of the size of these lenses. So before I take you into the next chapter, I need to introduce you to four very important people in this story. On the left is John Richardson Wigan. He was a Scotsman who went to Dublin um, when he was 19, took over, eventually took over his brother-in-law's firm when he died. The firm Edmondson were actually uh, gas makers. They, they actually fitted out domestic houses. But he had a, a cousin um, in uh, England who was involved in maritime, well, he was a shipbuilder. And so Wigan started to get interested in the whole maritime industry and actually invented the first River Boy, uh, which is now in the Maritime Museum down in Dunleary, which I think is well worth a trip uh, if, you, if you're interested. Thomas, Thomas Stevenson from the Scottish the Northern Lighthouse Board um, was probably the lighthouse engineer. Incredibly famous, a very famous family. Robert Louis Stevenson <coughs> was his son. So it was a very, very famous and well-respected uh, engineer and lighthouse family. John Tyndall, the famous physicist, worked was the advisor to Trinity House, which is the English uh, lighthouse authority. And then James Nicholas, uh, Douglas, who was the en engineer working for Trinity. I should say there's one board missing from this, which is the Commissioners of Irish Lights. Um, they were, um, so John uh, Wigan was talking to them, but they were on his side, so they're on the goodie side. So these gentlemen are key to the story. And Wigan invented this. It's called the Crocus Burner. Because if you ever cut a crocus in half, it has this wonderful ringed shape. This crocus burner, produced in 1865, um, initially had 28, uh, but then he invented 32 jets that came out, and, and it came out in different rings so that you could have 32, 76, 108 gas flames coming out of this burner. So you could step it up depending on the um, in conditions uh, out at sea. It was revolutionary. It went into Bailey Lighthouse, which is uh, on, on House Oath, uh, just north of Dublin, as a trial. And it was a great, uh, the Commissioners of Irish Lights thought it was a great success, but Thomas Stevenson rubbished it, so it was useless. And partly it was difficult because the amount of light it produced meant that even in a first order lens, the light was spilling out of the lens, so you weren't getting all of it captured to send out as a beam. Um, the other problem, well, the other, the other genius part of it was that this produced the flash. So, if you look, if 
if you look, there's a pilot light gas supply, and that pilot light kept the gas burning. But the regulator then could turn the, the flames off. So when the flames went up, you got light, it went off, you got darkness. And that could produce the characteristic flash. It's now produced a different way, but this was pretty revolutionary. You started to get a really good flashing light with a very small beam. This burner was 13 times brighter than the best light being produced. So it was a big deal. In um, the 1880s, there was enormous pressure to new, move Mew Island Lighthouse, which was on Lighthouse Island, onto New Island. The trouble with uh, the Lighthouse Island, it's lower than Mew, so that ships were essentially running into Mew Island because they couldn't see the light on the Lighthouse Island. So people like Harlan and Wolf said, this isn't good enough. We need a better light because Harlan and Wolf uh, and Liverpool were two, uh, Belfast ports and Liverpool were becoming extremely important and they wanted good navigation into the port. So they put pressure on the Commissioner of Irish Lights, saying we want to move this lighthouse. The commissioners agreed, and it was planned that it would move um, onto New Island. So Wigan went, Yahoo, I have a chance. I can get my new gas burner with a new improved optic. Stevenson had come up with the idea of a bigger lens, but he did nothing about it. In 1876, Wigan went to the Royal Dublin Society and said, I have created this fantastic new big lens, which, we, which we're going to call a hyperradial lens. It's going to produce the most brilliant light with my burner. Commissioner of Irish Lights, can I go ahead? Yes, said the commissioners, but the Board of Trade said no. He was being, they were being influenced by uh, Nicholas, uh, Sir Nicholas Douglas and Stevenson, who did not believe that this was the appropriate way to go. So, sadly, New Island um, was fitted with a tri-form first-order lens. So three lots of lenses in three, in, sorry, lenses in three tiers. This produced an enormous <coughs> beam. You think the beam is going to come across out here. You're talking about 15 to 16 feet of light. And why new was important was it, it is a landfall lighthouse. And a landfall lighthouse is a lighthouse that is seen from a long way, it needs to be about 30 miles out. So ships traveling long oceans, um, Tory Island, uh, Bull Rock, these are all landfall lighthouses. So they needed the tallest light. So the tower on you is really tall, and then you had this really impressive optic at the top, producing this massive beam of light. But it wasn't what Wigan wanted. He wanted to use his hyperradial lens. And the hyperradial lens, you think that the first order is 920 millimeters. A hyperradial lens is 1.3 millimeters. It's massive. So his next chance came with the, what are regarded as extremely famous experiments that were carried out on South Foreland. South Foreland is near Dover. Um, I actually went to school next to the North Foreland Lighthouse, which is up the road from South Foreland. So every lesson, we, you know, fog. <laughs> so it's great. Um, so my love of lighthouses, I think, was, must have been, uh, goes back to then. And the South Fallen trials were instigated by Thomas Stevenson. There was a question about fuel. Which was the best and most economic fuel? Gas, electricity, or oil? Oh, well, paraffin as it was then. They also started to experiment with uh, 
optics with lenses. And Wiggum saw a chance to actually get his optic in with the crocus learner. Douglas complained and tried to block him. Tyndall was so furious at what was going wrong, he felt it was so unjust that he, in the end he resigned, resigned from Trinity House. He was so angry that Douglas was being unfair. In the end, what Douglas was suggesting was that Wiggum's crocus burner he had invented for the Edison Lighthouse back in the 1850s. He was proved wrong, and in the end, he had to pay Wiggum £200 um, compensation for um, uh, misusing his patent. So this was important, and this proved that the gas burner with a big optic, a hyperradial optic, produced the strongest light. The best fuel was actually electricity, but they couldn't use electricity. It was much harder to produce back at that time. It ultimately was going to be used as the uh, fuel of choice. So here's the hyperradial lens. You have this bull, bullseye in the middle, which is the magnifying power. You have these um, lenses here, which bend, so the light's coming up and it gets bent, and it gets bent <coughs> into this very big straight beam. And this is why it was so, uh, so important. And because it's a bigger lens, it captures all of the light from uh, Wigan's burner. So the first hyperradial optic ever fitted went into Tory Island. So this is the drawings from bon uh, Barbier, who made the uh, lenses. So here it's a triform. It was turned by a clockwork mechanism, and it had the three crocus burners um, inside the, the, the um, lantern. So this is a lantern. This is for exhausting gas fumes at the top, and this is the route that the lighthouse keeper had to walk up. And he had to walk up every, I think it's 30 to 40 minutes, to wind up the mechanism which is turning the, the optic. So it's hard, hard going. So this is the first one ever made in the world. It was um, operated by gas, so it was um, uh, coal gas. Um, and this is a photograph uh, aerial photograph, here are the gas cylinders. So if you think about the, the, the burner and you think about a foggy night, so down goes the sun, slight mist, 32 flames, a mm, bit worried, first, you're thinking about the first here, 32 flames, let's turn it up, so it can go all the way up to 108 flames. The fog gets thicker, you can now go to the second tier and you can add another 108 flames. And if it's pea soup, it's a third, a third tier and another 108 flames. So you're getting an enormous strong light beaming out. The trouble is, the guy making the gas is shoveling like hell to make that gas. And he's got to shovel all night long or until the, gas, until the fog lifts. So, it, not, not a lot of fun. There are only 30, as far as the US Lighthouse Society, they did a big survey of hyperradials. There are only 30 ever made between 1887, Tory, and uh, 1913. They were only made for the key landhouse, uh, landfall light, lighthouses around the world. So, this is Hawaii. This you might recognize as Bishop Rock. It's used as the BBC One gets the helicopter flying in. That's Bishop's Rock. That's off the Scilly Isles. Um, Bull Rock is off Kinsale. Uh, that's Tory. That's new. Um, this one is a very famous one, which is Cape Wrath. And Cape Wrath is the lighthouse that picked up the distress signal from RMS Titanic and sent out the Capetia to, to, to rescue her. 
So it's in Newfoundland, so again, these vast distance of, of sea, the lighthouses guiding the mariners, saying, you've arrived at the coast. Hello, big lighthouse. I learned, I learned a, a new word on Saturday, because I was with the Donica D guys, and I learned the word loom, um, which I didn't know before, which, if I'm right, it's what you see on the horizon from the sweep of light. So while they don't necessarily see the actual light, they can see the sweep on the horizon. And if you've traveled thousands of miles across the ocean, I imagine seeing that, that sweep must be a very welcome sight. Um, if I just go back, of that 30, 20 are left. Um, and of that 20, only two intact are on display, and they're both in Scotland. The Gearloch uh, Museum, which is in Dumfries, and Fraserburg near Aberdeen. They're the only two that you can go and see that are intact. The Fraserburg one is still in its tower. Um, where did they go? Well, to get, and maybe we'll uh, cover this, but to get a lighthouse, lighthouse optic out of a lantern is hard work. So I'm afraid sometimes the most easiest way is to ditch it into the sea. Of the, there were three styles of hyperradial optics. Only four were made in this early style. And of that four, Tory, and I'll explain Tories, and Muse are the only ones left. 1920s, there was all change. New Ireland, with the first order optic, was causing problems. So they wanted to solve this. So they took Tory Island's hyperradial optic out of Tory, and they sent it to Chance Brothers in Birmingham, and Chance Brothers adapted it. So instead of having three tiers, it now has two. And instead of it, it would have had six lenses all the way around, it now has four, and then you have two blanks. And that is now what is going to produce the flash. So it's not going to be a gas flash, it's going to be a blank flash, it's much easier. The other addition is this, invented in 1890, and it's the mercury bath. This is ingenious because it created a frictionless base of which the optic could rotate. The guys were telling me on Saturday that it was so effective that you could just literally push the optic round with your finger when this lot weighs about six, seven tons. So this was a fantastic, not environmentally nice, but uh, a very clever solution to actually producing the, the, that frictionless aspect. So if you think, if you had um, three layers with six lenses, that's 18 lenses, you've now created one with four and four, that's eight. So you actually have got eight lenses left. And so what they did then was they then copied that for Tory. This one, this one, the original, went back into Mew. Not back into Tory, back into Mew. And the copy went into Tory. And we know this because this is actually, the frame is stamped Barbier, Barbier and Finestra. So we know that's the original. And when they did that, they actually <coughs> had to reduce the size of the lantern. So here's a little bit of historical evidence. So this is a Tory Island Lighthouse postcard I found on the web. Here's the, the tall lantern for three tiers. Here's Mew Islands, which has been cut down into two-tier uh, lantern. So a lot of work went to do to fix this. Sorry. Um, the other thing that changed was the fuel and the lamps. So the fuel stopped being gas, it went to paraffin, and ultimately went to electricity. It's uh, when it went to electricity, you had halide lamps, metal halide lamps, and then more recently it's gone to an LED, so, and it's become automated. So you no longer need lighthouse keepers, uh, you no longer needed the optic, because the strength of light now produced 
from that LED is so strong, it doesn't need the massive hyper radial that was there before. And when this, when, when you had a metal halide lamp in, they only used the top tier for, for lighting. The bottom tier was used for emergencies. So just a little bit of statistics. So now the new optic island lighthouse, uh, lighthouse optic is the oldest surviving hyperradial optic. One of 30, one of 20 left, one of the only one other than its copy surviving from this design. So it's a very special thing. Um, and it will be um, really significant to say that. Clearly, when the Commissioners of Irish Lights decided to turn it to LED, they had to take the optic out. And that has been an was an enormous task in 2014. And I, at that point, I'm going to hand back to me. So in 2014, um, we were approached by the Commissioners of Irish Lights um, because they've been looking for the last few years um, uh, a home to save me and they recognised the importance with Belfast Maritime um, Heritage. So uh, they contacted us and we organised a research trip out to uh, Me Island. So I went out with Titanic Belfast and Titanic Quarter Limited. So it's probably one of the lucky ones to actually get to go right upside or up and stand in the optic itself, which is absolutely amazing. So as part of the rescue operation, um, Titanic Foundation decided that um, we apply for a heritage lottery fund to save um, the optic. So the next couple of slides are just going to cover um, how we applied to heritage lottery fund. But um, it took eight men, two boats and one helicopter in over three weeks to remove um, the optic from you. So we've um, created a wee video in-house as part of our it's like digital media campaign. Um, which we did online to save New Island Optics and some of now. activity at the minute. The um, Lighthouse Optic is down in the Commissioners of Irish Lights um, warehouse and it's um, being reassembled and they're currently working on um, all the restoration um, work with it. And then while they're um, in the process of doing that there we carried out extensive research with them. Irish Lights and a conservation statement was drafted. We then uh, submitted an uh, application to the Heritage Lottery Fund which we were uh, through the first pass and in the process of going in for stage two. Um, as part of that application, it um, included quite a lot of uh, community work, um, stakeholder engagement with the likes of Belfast Harbour Commissioners, um, Titanic Quarter Limited, Titanic Belfast, NIEA. Um, we also did a uh, community engagement just to see what local people thought. So we ran a social media poll um, with 93% of people saying they'd love to see the optic coming into Titanic Quarter, the other six said they just need a wee bit more information. Um, <coughs> community engagement as well. We also did a questionnaire um, and left it in the Doc Cafe just for local people to get their opinions on it. We went out to um, interview people at the Kite Festival, which took place last year, and then we also carried out interviews um, at one of our Harland and Wolf reunion events. Um, so the wee video that we just played there, um, we also ran it through a social media campaign and had over 3,600 views, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and then we also plugged into um, 
our local TV and radio channels. So Northern <coughs> Visions um, pulled together a documentary because again it sort of targets all local people across Northern Ireland. So in terms of letter of support, we had 16 in total, um, and that included the Royal Lighthouse Society, Northern Ireland Environment the Agency, sort of key stakeholders across the Titanic Quarter. So again, Belfast Harbour Commissioners, Titanic Quarter Limited, Belfast City Council, and um, Queen's University, so the physics <coughs> and engineering departments, and um, Committee for the International Year of Light, which was last year, um, National Trust, and then First Belfast City Council. So um, digital coverage for us again is key because it's a great way of monitor monitoring all your activity that you're doing as part of um, the Heritage Lottery Fund. So this is just one of the wee screenshots from Facebook. So the, the video got a reach of over 10,000 people um, and then it had 3,000 people or just over viewing it and then um, quite a lot of engagement. So again, we would say do quite a lot of work in, in terms of promoting the sort of European Heritage Open Days and um, Northern Ireland Science Festival um, and sort of key international celebrations. So we um, ran this as part of the what was it European Technical and Industrial Heritage um, Week. So again, we promoted new, we promoted um, the drawing offices, um, HMS Caroline, and um, the pump house. So it's sort of connecting all the heritage assets across the quarter. So in terms of funding through the project, um, again, as I said, we've secured Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, we secured funding through Belfast City Council's investment program, Ulster Garden Villages, and then Titanic Foundation will be putting money towards it. And then, of course, in kind support, Irish Lights um, will be looking after the restoration. Obviously, they've just done the removal, transport, helping with the installation, then offering um, key advice to us. And then Belfast Harbour and Titanic Quarter um, have um, gifted the land where the optic will be located. So in terms of engagement, just on a bit of a timeline here. So back in January when um, we uh, heard about the Heritage Lottery Fund announcement, again we went out on a key key channels picked it up. So it was on UTV, Your Place in Mind, and VTV, and then of course all the local papers. Um, April to June, and um, we ran a design competition to build the structure for the optics. So we had over 30 architects um, uh, come for an information session at Titanic Belfast. We had um, 12 submissions, which is actually currently <coughs> on show in Titanic Belfast, which we're going to cover in a minute. Um, and then November to March, and um, we engaged with key politicians across East Belfast, and were able to secure 85,000 towards the optic. And uh, then again in July 2016, we went out to press um, to make the announcement for Hall McKnight and uh, approval of the council funding. And again, UTV and MVT um, picked up the features, which is great for local media. Um, so just engagement continued. Um, again, we've been doing quite a lot of community engagement. So um, we spoke to all the residents at uh, the Ark, which is just across the road. So there's over 3,000 people out there. Um, May 16, um, we've been briefed in the East Belfast Partnership um, Committee, which again look after all uh, local people across East Belfast. Um, and then again, we'll be doing on, ongoing briefings and presentations with um, key stakeholders. And um, we'd love to come down to Donica D and down to Bangor just to engage with all the local community who've um, seen New York any connections with it. Um, and then again, uh, working with the likes of National Trust and all key stakeholders across Titanic Quarter. So um, some of the activity we've already kicked off as part of the Heritage Lottery Fund, so it's all about community engagement and uh, engaging with stakeholders. So um, on the 29th of October, we, as part of the big draw festival, we ran the big lighthouse draw. So we had um, 50 people in attendance and um, all the kids got opportunities to make little mini lighthouses. The LED lights in them, and then um, we made a big massive draw, which again is um, great to get engagement from the um, younger generation. And then again, um, we're monitoring all our digital conversations online, so um, all the press releases that we secured, um, we're keeping a note of all um, engagement with us here. So again, even that one tweet just about the press release got. Um, over 4,000 um, impressions again, which is great for putting in the Heritage Lottery Fund to show that um, a, it's key to save the um, lighthouse optic. 
So back on the timeline, uh, as I was saying earlier, in July 2016, um, Hall Knight won the design competition. So this is just some of the illustrations, early drafts that um, they've uh, sent in. So this is for the optic. Um, and the uh, key <coughs> things behind it is going to create an iconic landmark in Belfast waterfront. Um, it's to educate, inform and excite the public about the optics, local, national and international significance. And it's going to be free access and we're hoping it will attract over 100,000 visitors per annum. So in terms of um, where the optics going to be located, it's going to be located on the Titanic walkway. So uh, Titanic Quarter Limited are currently working with Tourism NI. Um, and they're developing, it's going to be a riverside walk, which is going to connect the bottom of the slipways right right down to um, Titanic Stock um, Pump House. So again, it's, the optic's going to be um, a key asset connecting all of Titanic Quarter's maritime heritage. Um, again, it's a key location as well because it's located right on the water side. So if you're at the bottom of the slipways and you look at the film studios, it's just going to go adjacent on the corner. So that's just another screenshot of it. So again, back to the activity plan, um, our key audiences are obviously lighthouse communities. So again, we'd love to talk to everybody today um, in the audience, um, science and engineering community, children and young people, visitors and tourists, key stakeholders and funders, um, and of course the local community, and then some of our objectives are having 100,000 visitors come to the Optic, and 30 people will be trained up and we're hoping to set up um, a volunteer program. So even yesterday we had one person come in to say they'd like to volunteer in the program. It's great. So um, the activity plan is going to include a series of events and information sessions. Um, like I was saying earlier on, we, um, as part of European Heritage Open Days, Maritime Festivals, we'll be including um, New Island Optic in that, whether it's tours around the um, the optic itself or even connected in with like Northern Ireland Science Festival, so you put your engineer in um, sort of subjects like that. Um, again, international days will be celebrating. We'll be doing a series of educational workshops and creating digital toolkits. And we'll be uh, creating a mobile responsive website to tell the story of the optic. And um, we'll have a digital communications plan and then we'll be wanting to do a celebration event. So we're thinking something along the Festival of Lights. So, just as I said earlier, the 12 architects that entered the competition, the exhibition is actually down show in the Andrews Gallery. So, it's running until um, the 12th of November. So, if anybody's about it's free to attend. Um, so, you can just pop in and have a look at all the um, sort of architectural designs that were entered. And we also have it um, on our Facebook page as well. So I'd like to say thanks for having us so along to speak about me. Uh, then we've got a question or is there just there's a few questions on me just to see what you think. Um, um, thank you.